Good evening. I represent the Janusz Kartyka Foundation. It's my pleasure to invite you to the first Seeds of History meeting organized by our foundation and the allies of the Polish clubs in the US. Long live free and independent Poland a discussion surrounding Professor Falba's book, The People of Poland at War, 1940-1918. Let me welcome our guests from the Alliance of the Polish Clubs in the US, in USA. Welcome, Professor Andrzej Falba. Professor, welcome. Paweł Kurtyka, the head of the Janusz Kurtyka Foundation. Mr. President, hello. Pacyga. Professor Judith Patsyga and Daniel Pogorzelski will be our moderators. Hello. Hello. The Seeds of History project is funded from the Chancellor of the President of Poland and the media partner is Blockpress PL, a website. Ucja Mirowska Kopecz, would you please take the floor? Thank you. Hello. On behalf of the Alliance of the Polish Clubs in USA, let me welcome you and say hello from Chicago. First, thank you to the Janusz Kutyka Foundation for reaching out to our organization to proceed with the Seeds of History project. We are really happy that we can coordinate this meeting together with the Foundation. And we are especially happy to have this meeting with Professor Andrzej Falba, the author of The People of Poland at War 1914-1918. Polish Heritage Month. This is our, this is uh, October in, in Poland, and we also celebrated the Polish national holiday. So basically this meeting is linked to Poland regaining independence. Let me present Professor Patsyga, the moderator. Professor Emeritus at Columbia College in Chicago. He wrote seven books on the history of Chicago, which is very closely linked to the history of the Polish minority. Professor of Chicago and Professor Illinois at Chicago. He taught there. He also taught at Campion Hall in Oxford. He also taught at the English Studies Institute at the University in Krakow. Professor Patsyga has received the Halecki Award. May I also add that he was the Marshal of the Irish Parade and he, well, we can say there's a true honor for us. Daniel Pogorzelski will also be here with us. He is passionate about the Polish minority in the US, passionate about ethnic related issues, forgotten Chicago, and other articles. A social activist. May I welcome all of the participants of this meeting, especially young people from the Polish school in the US. Please join us, be active. You can ask questions, put questions in the Q&A session to Professor Falba. The Polish road to independence was a winding road and now you can better understand that path. In, 18, in 1918, Poland regained independence after 123 years. I hope that you will find answers to your questions and that you can become the ambassadors of Poland and of the Polish history. May I give the floor to President Paweł Kurtyka, sir? Dziękuję bardzo. Szanowni Państwo, bardzo miło mi jest tutaj powitać w imieniu Fundacji, w imieniu Kurtyki, jako organizatora projektu the foundation, we organized the Seeds of History, a project, 
reprezentującą tutaj współorganizatora dzisiejszego spotkania panią Dr. Kopeć oraz z ramienia organizatora również pana profesora Pacygę i pana Daniela Kopeczkiego oraz rzecz jasna profesora Andrzeja Chwalby, autora książki Wielka Wojna Polaka. Nie jest to przypadek, że właśnie z tym autorem się dzisiaj spotykamy, dlatego że zarówno projekt Ziarna Historii, jak i projekt Nagrody im. Polskiej łączą się w działalności fundacji, dlatego że to właśnie książka pana profesora wygrała konkurs o Nagrodę im. Polskiej została przetłumaczona przez Fundację na język angielski, a następnie wydana w Międzynarodowym Wydawnictwie Peter Lang z światowym systemem dystrybucji. Zarówno projekt Ziaren Historii, jak i projekt Nagrody im. Janusza Kurtyki to realizacja misji statutowej naszej Fundacji. Tą misją jest poszerzanie dostępności pozycji wydawanych na rodzimym rynku, pozycji historycznych na świecie, a co za tym idzie również poszerzanie wiedzy na temat polskiej historii Disseminating knowledge about the history as widely as possible. Because there are certain truths that are often read in the media about the Polish history, and you can see the details in the media when they are published. They have become more and more widely discussed, and we would like to share with the media about the Polish history as widely as possible. They have become more and more widely discussed, and we would like to share with the media about the Polish history as widely as w debacie publicznej, a także oczywiście po to, żeby historia Polski była dobrze poznana. Jeśli chodzi o te zagadnienia związane z różnego rodzaju zafałszowaniami na temat polskiej historii, w naszej diagnozie w bardzo wielu okolicznościach one wynikają z tego, że po prostu polska historia jest nieznana. Taką wydaje nam się, że zwłaszcza tym w kraju, że każdy zna chociażby losy Polski podczas I czy drugiej wojny światowej, ale to jest nieprawda. Świat niewiele o tym wie. A dlatego też właśnie wydawane i tłumaczone przez nas książki również aktywnie promujemy. A w tym wypadku nawiązujemy w ramach projektu Ziarna Historii relacje z organizacjami zrzeszającymi naszych rodaków w Stanach Zjednoczonych i Kanadzie. Budujemy wraz z nimi sieć, co do której mamy nadzieję, że przez wiele lat będzie służyć promocji polskiej historii. Jeśli chodzi o cel tej promocji, to jest on dwojakiego rodzaju. Po pierwsze zdajemy sobie sprawę, że jest bardzo wielu członków Polonii, organizacji polonijnych, którzy już w drugim, trzecim, czwartym pokoleniu nie operują dobrze językiem polskim. Bardzo wielką słabością naszego rynku wydawniczego polskiego jest to, że mało książek wydawanych jest w języku angielskim, w związku z tym powstaje bariera dostępności do badań i do wiedzy, do literatury na temat polskiej historii. Celem naszym jest, żeby tą barierę usunąć i dlatego dostarczamy polski już w języku angielskim oraz organizujemy tłumaczone spotkania z autorami tych książek, po to, żeby mogli o nich opowiedzieć. A więc pierwszą taką naszą grupą docelową jest sama Polonia w tych pokoleniach czy w tych osobach, którzy już polskim językiem nie władają. Natomiast nasz cel jest szerszy, dlatego że w oczywisty sposób problemy z wizerunkiem Rzeczypospolitej, czy też problemy z różnego rodzaju zafałszowaniami i nieprawdami na temat polskiej przeszłości biorą się stąd, że w historii naszego kraju nie znają również 
Amerykanie czy Kanadyjczycy, szerzej nie Polacy, którzy z polską narodowością czy, czy z polską tożsamością w żaden sposób się nie łączą. Tutaj bardzo wielką nadzieję pokładamy właśnie we współpracy z organizacjami. Dlatego, że uważamy, że są te organizacje takim naturalnym ambasadorem polskości, że jako organizacje, które zrzeszają ludzi na co dzień kontaktujących się ze swoimi amerykańskimi współpracownikami, przyjaciółmi, są najkrótszą drogą do tego, żeby prawdę o naszej historii, czy też materiały dotyczące tej historii im dostarczać i w ten sposób przyczyniać się do dyfuzji wiedzy so na temat polskiej przeszłości, do takiego oddolnego przenikania. To, co my możemy zrobić, aby to było możliwe, to właśnie dostarczyć materiału. Dlatego w ramach projektu Ziarna Historii dostarczamy organizacjom, które z nami współpracują w ramach sieci, książki już przetłumaczone, po to, żeby można było te książki dystrybuować i rozdawać wśród tych osób, które wskażą same organizacje, oraz organizujemy spotkania z historykami po to, żeby można było o tych książkach rozmawiać. Mamy nadzieję, że ta sieć, którą wspólnie tworzymy, będzie silna i że w ciągu najbliższych lat wspólnie zorganizujemy szereg spotkań promocyjnych, a ta inicjatywa sprawi, że będziemy mogli mówić o tym, że poprawiliśmy wspólnymi siłami wraz z naszymi partnerami dostępność w polskiej historii w Stanach Zjednoczonych. Bardzo dziękuję dla tego Związkowi Klubów Polskich USA, że włączył się w naszą inicjatywę, że docenił wagę projektu i poprzez swoje dołączenie, swoją partycypację w tym projekcie wspiera nasze cele. Mam nadzieję, że to będzie owocna współpraca i oddaję teraz głos moderatorom. Bardzo serdecznie dziękuję. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'd like to thank the Foundation for inviting me. The Janusz Kurtyka Foundation has launched an innovative project, which is an ambitious one as well, and that requires constant and continuous support. Research on Polish history and culture is ongoing and a lot of progress has been made since the 1980s when nobody knew virtually anything about our history. It was Poland was just a country located somewhere in the east of Europe and nobody paid enough attention to it. Professor Patsyka has probably heard about the congresses of foreign scholars organized in Krakow. These were meetings organized every five years that bring together 400, 500 scholars from all across the globe who focus on Polish history. At the third Congress, there were representatives of 40 different countries of the world, including representative of Korea, India, and even South Africa, Brazil, Brazil Mexico, as well as a substantial number of US scholars and researchers. Our Jerry grants an award which is granted to the winner. It's the Senate's award that goes to the author of the best book, the best foreign book focusing 
on Polish history. The award is also coupled with a statuette, Gal Anonym statuette, that is also granted to the winners. And so the winners can be proud to have received this excellent award. So we have 160 entries. There were, for example, books from Japan and South Korea. Of course, sometimes there are problems related to the language barrier. However, a lot is changing. A lot has changed already. There's also a personal note I'd like to strike in reference to what the doctor said. On the 3rd of May, I had the pleasure to share information about our public holiday. I shared information with people from the US and Canada via the Piłsudski Institute that organized a meeting about that topic. And I have to tell you, I was really delighted by the questions that I received and that proved that the audience members had vast knowledge about Polish history. Those people who participated in the meeting really were keenly interested in the history of Poland. The Kurtyka Foundation, as well as the Alliance of Polish Clubs, would like to disseminate further knowledge about Polish culture and history. And I would like to cheer you on, and I can only hope for the best in your endeavors. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let us talk about the process of the restoration of Polish independence, because we're not talking about something that happened overnight. It was a lengthy process. Everything that is um, considered a watershed moment takes time. It was very difficult for us to reclaim the independence that we had lost. And that's why the 11th of November has become a symbolic day, a symbolic moment for Poland. 123 years, that's for how long Poland did not exist on the map. There was no Polish statehood. Four or even five full generations. Back in the 16th century, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was a European superpower, so to speak. In the 17th century, the Polish culture was disseminated all across the Central and Eastern European region. Very often, even the Polish language was used um, outside of Poland in the Orthodox churches to the East. Polish carols were sung. Well, of course, the quality of the Polish language was not perfect, but still, it was in use. This proves that Poland was an important part of the geopolitical paradigm of those times. And then all of a sudden, it was wiped off the maps. However, there was no Poland, but the Polish culture persisted. The Polish culture had an important contribution to the development of global and European culture and heritage. That's something that we cannot forget. Subsequent generations of Poles passed on the Polish culture and the Polish heritage. There were Polish writers, the Polish historians, and participants of Polish uprisings who passed on the history from generation to generation. The Polish women also played an important part in that process. Without Polish women, without Polish mothers, 
there would be no history of Poland in the 19th century. Excellent. So 1918 was a year marked by the Polish success. But why didn't it come earlier? Why did it happen when it did? Did Poles simply come to terms with the fact that they were no longer an independent country? We know it for a fact that they never came to terms with the fact there were whole groups in the Polish society who thought that Poland would never recover independence. However, the majority of Poles never accepted what happened. They simply thought that it was an interim period. It was like a break in a performance, just as it happens in the theater. Just a short-lived break, short-lived break, but the history will be resumed at some point. And so, we should not now deliberate or try to answer the question why the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth fell. Different scholars have tried to answer that question. However, what I'd like to focus on was the type of attempts made by Poles to restore their independence. They looked for allies, but where could you look for allies? Who would be willing to work with us? So Poles wanted to find allies whose interests would be in sync with Polish interests. So in history, there are also various interests that are at stake. And so it is. it was up to the Polish politicians of the 19th century to correctly understand the intentions of European powers, those powers who were in conflict with those countries that had partitioned Poland. Because, ladies and gentlemen, our it was extremely difficult. Maybe if it was just one power who had overrun us, we wouldn't have waited 123 years, but we had three countries that partitioned Poland. So it was all the more difficult to recover our independence. So even if we won against one enemy, there were still two more left to fight. Tadeusz Kościuszko was a hero of Poland, France and the US. And he also played an important part in the uprisings. After his victory at Ratswawice, that's when his myth has started. Then in the next battle, he faced the Russians, but he also faced Prussia at the same time, and he lost that next battle. He was not expecting to face the Prussians as well. So had we faced the Russian forces only, he would have won, and then his path to Warsaw would be open. But then what he experienced was a solidarity of the partitioning powers, and that's why his attempt failed. Uh, 
After the collapse of the Polish state, the partitioning powers noticed what the situation was. And there was this politician who had great aspirations. His name was Napoleon Bonaparte. He was 1 meter 59 centimeters tall. So he was not of a very imposing posture. He might have had a complex and that's why he wanted to impress both men and women. And he was the one who managed to overturn the order that had prevailed in Europe for many years. So, understanding was struck and legions, Polish legions, were to be created. Napoleon starts his war with Prussia. He wins then another war with Austrians. He wins again. As a result, the this 1795 order is put into question and the dukedom of Warsaw, the duchy of Warsaw, is founded. Was it really important to some extent? The army is excellent, culture blooms. By the way, this army is still mentioned in European literature. Duke Poniatowski and Dombrovsky are excellent leaders. There is a richness of excellent commanders. However, the greatest value here is not the equality in the face of the law that the constitution guaranteed. Well, this was just theory. What was really important was that a certain order can be unsealed even though it was it was sealed by three partitioning powers there is this well-known experiment involving i'm not sure mice or rats conducted years ago so certain mice had been in, in had been free and then they got locked up so they struggled to get out. They lived longer. Those who had always lived in captivity, they would die earlier. So coming back to Poles, this moment is very important for us, psychologically speaking. It's a bit of a breakthrough. You can defeat three partitioning powers as long as you can find somebody who will have interest in common with us, that we can side with. Well, Napoleon's history is over. It finishes the way it's finished. He was a warrior. He had to fight. There are some people who can do nothing else. And for him, war was life. So, he had to face Russia to attack England in the future, and thus the history of the Dutch of Warsaw was over. It was a message for us, though. Let us seek, let's seek and we will find. And then another uprising breaks out, the November uprising. The Polish migrants are beloved in Warsaw because the Polish Romantics are considered the Knights of Freedom. And there is this excellent person, Prince Adam Czartoryski, one of the greatest statesmen in the 19th century. It's not just my opinion. 
English language, German language, and other scholars believe that too. Various books have been translated into other languages. So he says, the foremost enemy is Russia. Let us find friends in Europe, friends that have a similar situation, namely um, France and England. And this is what happens. The Crimean War breaks out and then we hear, okay, Poles, you will receive something from us. First, however, you need to fight in the lands that had been taken over by Russia. And after the fall of the November uprising, there was no conspiracy, there was no strength that would at the time be able to face the Russian army. Yes, various uh, organizations, military organizations are founded in Constantinople. Be now the Ottomans become the French and English allies. So this is the moment where a part of the Poland, a part of Poland, a part of the Polish, of one of the partitions regained independence, but we were not really ready for it. However, what Czartoryski wrote at the time was really ingenious. So, this is when we're looking for allies among the European powers. And France is one of them. They had high hopes for France, others, they had hopes for England and Turks, the Ottoman Empire, after all. Um, Turks never accepted the act of partitioning, by the way, just an aside. They never did accept it, but it's not because they loved us so much or they remembered that we defeated them at Vienna. No, the Congress of Vienna was not present. The Ottoman Empire was not present at the Congress of Vienna, and that is why they basically never accepted the partition of Poland. Colonel Tchaikovsky, General Bem, were converted to Islam. Today we have this clash of cultures, clash of religions. It is. It seems difficult to imagine. Some people held a grudge, but it only happened in the 20th century because Bem did convert to Islam. Now the question is, why did he do that? He did that for the love of Poland. It was all due to the strength of his passion for Poland. He changed his faith, his religion, because he believed that the Polish army could be created that would fight side by side with Turks against Russia. Unfortunately, Turks lost all these wars. And who did we look at? Well, some people wanted various partition powers to fight together. So some people bet on Russia to defeat Prussians, others they wanted Austrians to defeat Russians, but it came to naught. Now I have mentioned the uprisings, they failed unfortunately. So we are talking about the 19th century. This century was lost for us, for Poles, because we never regained independence. However, it was not totally lost. After all, there was this continuity of sorts. People still th thought about Poland possibly returning to the map of Europe. And we are talking about some kind of state that would not be made up made up of scraps, but rather it would be about having Poland as a whole. Now, the January Uprising 
On the banners, we have an eagle in a crown, and also we have other symbols that symbolize Lithuania and Ruthenia. Poland, Lithuania and Ruthenia were represented on those banners, and people hoped that it would bear fruit. And then we have 1914. The year is 1914. What's different about 1914? Something happened, something that before people could only hope for, namely the partitioning powers. They were divided. The Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Second Reich were in one political block while Russians led by Romanovs, England and France were in the other. Then the US would join the alliance too. Other countries will join too, including Japan and China. One of them in 14, the other in 1917. But what is really important is the conflict. But was it a foregone conclusion that Poland would reappear? No. Neither the Western powers nor the central powers, nor Russia, saw a way of improving the fate of Poles after the end of the war. For them, the Polish affair was over. It was not an international issue. Nobody was interested in reinstituting Poland as a state. Neither way were they interested about other in other countries, uh, you know, um, Slovakia or Czechia, Serbia, and others. And those countries did appear after World War One. So it is not the war that made Poland reappear. War, the war, finished. By the way, they planned that the plans were that it would be over quite soon. So if the war had finished as early as it was planned, Poland would never appear. So I don't know what our meeting today would be about. I don't even know what language we would be, we would be speaking. What would have happened to us throughout the century? since. I don't know that. By the way, Bismarck issued a warning. Those two units were of equal power. The economic potential, the military potential of both these alliances was similar. For that reason, autumn 1914 resulted in those states, those powers being entrenched. They were in trenches, but at the same time, the economies were suffering terribly. People were murdered, sons were dying. Over 10 million men fell in that war. Another killer, the Spanish flu. We are talking about the summer and autumn 1918. It all started in the West, by the way. We know that. On top of that, you had thousands of people that were disabled, 20 million wounded. At the end of 2018, societies say, that's enough, we are fed up. 
revolutions break out. The first one in Russia in 1917, military rebellions break out. It is difficult for the British to continue because they were also suffering huge losses. Even though they are being supported by their own dominion, their allies. And it is only, as we know, the participation of the US that was the decisive moment. Europe was tired at the time, it was exhausted. So Europe could not preserve what it had had in 1914. So basically Europe had been in those pincers and those pincers crumbled to dust. We Poles, we lived in Central Europe. It had been ossified. It had been set in stone, it seemed indestructible and yet it also fell to dust once that stone crumbled to dust we saw an opportunity let's look at the austro-hungarian empire we've got eighty thousand deserters in the austro-hungarian partition and at first, there were only 170. This is the number in 1914. At first, everybody was eager to go to war. And Poles in Austro-Hungarian empires would shoot at their compatriots wearing different uniforms, Prussian and Russian, or rather the Russians. Those in Russian uniforms would shoot at Poles in the Austro-Hungarian Prussian empires. Józef Piłsudski, his greatness cannot be questioned. Paderewski was very much active in the US. As a result, we see a Polish army in France. By the way, the original name was Kościuszko's army. At first, Canadian Poles were supposed to form the corps, but there were very few of them. Before the, bro the war broke out in Europe, in the US, there were certain paramilitary organizations that brought together almost 20,000 20, young patriots. These were virtual boys who believed the US to be their surrogate homeland, but they still wanted to go back to Poland in order to build a prosperous state from the ground up. A state that would be wise with the wisdom of its population and of its elites. So these young boys, with the acceptance of uh, President Wilson, sailed to Poland and establish Heller's army there. Without that army, the fate of Galicia would have been quite different. Some of them later returned to the US after the war ended, but some of them stayed. They stayed put in Poland and they kept on fighting against the Bolsheviks in 1919 and 1920. So it's worth remembering because back then, the Poles in the US had two important reasons to be proud. Very often these people had limited education, they were underpaid, they were blue collar workers, but it gradually started changing later on. However, there were two figures that really proved that Poles were not only good laborers working in Chicago or in Cleveland in the steelworks, in the slaughterhouses or in the car manufacturing plants of Detroit, but that they also had global scale representatives. One of them was Helena Modrzejewska. She was a celebrity of the time. 
in the US, women dressed like Modrzejewska. They had their eyes fixed on her. If she was alive today, she would probably launch a range of cosmetics called Modrzejewska or Modrzejewska. Back then, in the top restaurants, you could taste a menu that was prepared according to Modrzejewska recommendations. So, so the Polish community in the US was proud of her. She was a symbol. And there was another person that was a real crowd puller and also a kind of a celebrity. Popular amongst young girls. That was Paderewski. Several thousand people visited Carnegie Hall to attend his concert. Carnegie Hall was the largest venue to host such music related events. So he was another celebrity. He was a real star of the time. He was like a showbiz celebrity. And so he had a direct line to the White House. He would be accepted um, at the White House to talk to the president. And he also made a huge donation to Wilson's presidential campaign. And as you know, the supporters who make donations during the campaign later expect a payback. And so this, these efforts of so many people have increased Poland's chances of regaining independence. That coupled with Wilson's 13 points and other events launched an avalanche, an avalanche of declarations back in 1918. And in 1918, it was already certain that Poland would be recreated. What was uncertain were the details, the details, the actual territory and the potential of Poland, but it was accepted that Poland would be brought back to the map of Europe. And that was all thanks to our resolve, our determination. And it was also coupled with a lucky period. It was just pure luck that we had as well that helped us along. Without that, we wouldn't have succeeded. So yes, Lady Luck smiled on us. And Professor, Doctor, hopefully she will keep on smiling at us in future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. And now I will hand over to Professor Patsyga. Can you please moderate the next part of the session? Thank you. Um, Dr. Kvalba, I uh, really appreciate the fine overview you've just given of Polish history. Um, and uh, uh, in this Poland struggle for independence. Uh, your book is a very interesting study uh, of the impact of World War I on the Polish lands. I would say a social history of the impact of the war on the Polish lands. There's perhaps too little time to discuss the entire book, of course, but several questions have jumped out at me. Uh, in, in many ways, the struggles of World War II have overshadowed those of World War I. But did the World War I experience in Poland pretend that of World War II? In both cases, Poland became a major battleground, was devastated, and uh, put the people of the Polish lands in dire circumstances. What is striking is the attitude of Germans towards Poles, both Jews and Christian. Uh, you mentioned slave labor camps in Germany, attitudes toward East European Jews, distrust of the Polish population, the refugee problem, particularly in uh, Galicia. Uh, and, and Poles are seen as treasonous, especially the Polish peasantry is seen as treasonous, but also the uh, upper classes. Um, and uh, that thousands were arrested in Galicia by the Austrians. Uh, this was aimed at Jews, Greek Catholics, and Orthodox Christians, but also at Polish Catholics. 
the similarities between the two wars seem striking. Do you, do you, do you see this as a, uh, as a period of almost preparation for World War II? It is a question to me. Yes. Yes, indeed. The Versailles Treaty was supposed to be a warranty of peace for dozens of years to come, but it turned out that it was not enough, it was not satisfactory to the countries that lost. And so the two countries that lost included Russia that lost vast territories to the West and its previous status as a global power ruling over swathes of the world and another country that lost was Germany, which was uh, trying to build a European Union, uniting and bringing together various territories to create a German Union. So that was the official name that was used by the Germans. They proposed to create a German Union that would create a set of countries that would be dependent on Germans, including Belarus, uh, Poland, Ukraine, and others. So there was a lot of propaganda in Germany and Germans were told that they would, their country would be a success story, that the war would be a success for them, that Germany would rise to be the greatest power of the world. And then they were disappointed. They not only failed to take over French and British territories, but they lost. Territory to Poland and to other countries as well. And so Germany was treated as the main villain, and that led to tension in Germany. And Germans started speaking out loud against it. And so there was this agreement struck between those two parties that used to be in conflict, according to the rule that my enemy my enemy's enemy is my friend. So Berlin started cooperating with Moscow starting in 1920 when the Red Army started approaching Warsaw. So Germany started collaborating and started supporting the Red Army that was approaching Warsaw. And then the Rapallo agreement was a confirmation of that and the Ribbentrop-Molotov agreement that started a new direction of the world of the war sorry was something that had been long time in brewing in preparation so we can say that in 1914, a new 30 years war started that ended in 1940s. The book we are talking about, The People of Poland at War, is a book that discusses international aspects, but only to some extent. It, much, it focuses much more on social everyday issues, such as rumors, gossip, what was gossip used for, how gossip was used to manipulate things. So these are very interesting um, topics that are mentioned. Uh, psychological war was also mentioned and the games played by the states in terms of propaganda efforts, fake news that, were that was disseminated. So the, the origin of face, fake news can be traced back to the Great War, the black market, 
that emerged for the first time uh, in Poland. You were asking me about the relationship to the Second World War and the Germans did not understand the black market, but we did, we did it, we did understand it well because we acquired the ability to navigate the black market in the First World War. So that was a great training ground. But if we want to draw a comparison between the two wars, we should, for example, mention mass displacements of laborers from Poland to the Second Reich. It all started in 1915. Then the same thing would happen in 1939. People would be caught uh, in the streets and then whole parts of the world would be fenced off. So roundups. It's a German invention. This is what they invented at the time. And farmers still remember that it was the Germans who invaded something that they don't like, namely dogs on chains and children. When they need to go to sleep at 10 p.m., they don't like it. People, children would like to keep playing after 10 p.m. Who came up with that? The Germans. 10 p.m. is the is your bedtime. It is when we stop disturbing our neighbors. So not only roundups were invented, but also there were other civilizational changes which were liked or disliked by many societies, including Poles. Another thing is what was happening to women. What was happening to women when men were fighting the war? They were taking over management, they were saving their families. Their maternal instinct was a very important factor in reducing the losses in the war. So the great powers, the big players is one thing, but it is also about the poetry of life. It is there, you asked about that, Professor, we find similarities between both world wars, the first and the second world war, between the first and the second occupation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I, I have uh, several other questions that perhaps uh, your book is so interesting. It's uh, a, a really a, a, a deep study of, of the war period. And, and I was asking, you know, how did the war impact uh, both the peasantry and the gentry, uh, the upper classes and the lower classes in Poland, in, in all three partitions? Well, there were also the merchants. Hmm. Well, Warsaw is the 10th European city, almost a million residents there. So what was happening to people in the cities was, was much worse than what was happening in the countryside. You know, because in the countryside, you can always grow something, you can survive. But if it stays there, it's not going to get to the cities. So the partitioners and then the occupiers would force people to give up food surplus to the occupying power. It is something that was invade, invented in World War I. So peasants, farmers were being robbed of food. Yet again, they had to think what can be done so that they are not robbed of everything, so that something can be sold to the cities because people wanted to buy food there. But the joblessness was reaching 50%. Inconceivable. At first, the value of industrial production in the Kingdom of Poland was 15% of the pre-war 
production. The Germans and Russians stripped those lands of everything. Basically, they left nothing there. They even took away pipes and cables. They stripped the industry of absolutely everything. And this was really dramatic for the cities. Now the countryside, the rural areas, it did suffer, not only because they had to give up surplus food, but front would go the, to and fro and the buildings were made of wood, timber, they would burn. And if you see what happened, well, when a bomb would drop, the hole in the ground would be 20 to 30 meters wide. And the military would dig trenches, cutting across the fields. It wasn't just a single trench, it was a whole network of parallel uh, trenches. Barbed wires, farmers, peasants, buildings are being dismantled and timber is used to build trenches. Basically, the countryside is disappearing. It's no longer there. It was a bit different in the Prussian partition. They didn't suffer. The nobility, they did suffer too. The nobility and gentry. The horses, basically the horses disappear. There are photos from 1919, 19, I believe. And a woman is plowing the field because they didn't have horses. There were whole stretches of land where they had no single horse. So, if it hadn't been for Hoover, if it hadn't been for the American assistance, well, even more people would be starved, would have starved to death. Next to Serbia, Poland was the most destroyed, demolished stretch of land in Europe. So, it was absolutely fantastic that Poland was restituted, but Poland was absolutely destroyed, demolished, with the exception of the western part of Poland. Thank you. Uh, this is very interesting. I, um, as you know, I'm an American historian, uh, and I write about Polonia. Um, and um, one of the things that struck me about World War I was the uh, amount of money that was raised in Chicago, New York, Cleveland, places like that, to be sent for Polish relief aid. Um, and and the, uh, much of this was sent through agencies, but sometimes this was also sent through the post uh, as possible. Uh, can you reflect on, on, on the relationship between Polonia in America and, 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 the, and Poland during both before the war? Uh, I, I, I especially one of the interests of mine is the Lviv uh, uh, Fair of 1894, which Polish Americans took part in, uh, and also uh, the raising of Haller's army, of course, the Blue Army, but also uh, this this idea of sending money as relief uh, to peasants and other and to families uh, back uh, back home in, in the uh, Ojizna. When it comes to Halle's army, the Polish army in France, so we did receive funds from the US, but it was a loan, it was a loan to fund this army and we had to repay it. The British used their own military navy to carry soldiers from the US to Europe, the Polish soldiers. It's beautiful, but it had to be paid for. Who negotiated those loans? The Polish, it was the Polish temporary government that was founded by Dmowski in Paris, 1917, I believe. He was given this right by the Allies 
And then there was inflation and hyperinflation, so the repayment negotiations dragged on. So coming back to this assistance to the people who lived in Poland or the Polish territories, well, there is this special committee that's also put in 1915, the Committee of the Veil, of Lausanne, it's also called. It's headed by a Nobel Prize winner, Henryk Sienkiewicz and Ignacy Pawedewski later. There are also other great people in this committee. They sit on it. Maria Curie. Maria Skodowska Curie is another member of the committee, also a Nobel Prize winner. She used her own money, private money, to support that committee. Another person who supported this committee was Joseph Conrad, a great English language writer who was bo born to a Polish family in Podole. So you have truly outstanding people who participate in this committee. It was thanks to that their help that the money flowed in. This money were also often collected by the councils of bishops in the world. The Pope issued an appeal, help Poland. There was an appeal made by the American bishops, help Poland, give assistance. And Catholic parishes, including the ones in Chicago, they did the same, do help Poland. But you maybe you will agree, Professor, 30 to 50 dollars a month was an average pay over an average worker in Chicago. So what they did give was peanuts, basically. It was maybe one, maybe five dollars, very small amounts. And out of these little amounts, a significant sum appeared. But when it comes to Polonia, the Polish minority, the, the, those people were too weak economically for this assistance to be really significant. And another thing, in the Polish lands, there are two basically camps. Some Poles want Berlin or Vienna to win. Others want the Allied to win. I mean, France or the UK. So basically, Poles were divided. And that conflict also appeared in the US. The Polish Polonia also are divided. Some people go to the left, some to, to the right. Some people say that we need to support the Polish legions, we need to support Piłsudski. Others call Piłsudski a traitor. So the, there was this internal strife, and as a result, the money wasn't as significant as it could have been. However, yeah. Jan Paderewski's support was really important because whenever he gave a concert, he would precede his music with a speech. He was as good an orator as a musician, and Americans would pay. Furthermore, he reached out to a number of great composers and musicians in the world. Henryk Sienkiewicz, a Polish writer, did the same. They were well recognized in the world. They were celebrities, if you will, they were recognizable. And that is why in all European countries, including neutral countries, you saw various committees to support Poland. All this money would flow to Switzerland and it was converted into Swiss francs. This money did not go to waste. It did go to Poland in 1919. And this money was used to support those people that needed help. Not a single penny was wasted. Then the committee got dissolved, having fulfilled its mission. It was an amazing undertaking, a special undertaking. So thank you for this question, Professor. It goes to show that, yes, we did regain our independence, but we were in a very difficult situation. It is difficult for us to imagine 
how deep those wounds were, how seriously those Polish lands were destroyed. Thank you. Uh, one, one more question, uh, Professor, if you'd like. Um, you mentioned rumor and gossip uh, in your, in your uh, presentation, but I found it to be a very intriguing part of your book. Uh, maybe you could explain that a little bit more clearly for our, our audience. Oczywiście no, jest na ten temat cały rozdział kilkudziesięciostronicowy. Yes, there is a whole chapter that covers just that. It shows how rumor originates, how gossip originates. Because this is what happened when the regular sources of information ceased. War breaks out and people find it really interesting. It shows. Let's look at this conflict at the polish belarusian border today, this current day and age. People who do not follow the media, usually now they are doing just that because they're curious. Well, back then it was a different conflict. You had millions of people in the old Polish ter territory that were drafted. They die, they are wounded, they return as disabled people. And people are interested. They want to know what is happening to them. What about the front? Is there anyone talking about it, about, the, about Poland? Is Poland going to be restored or not? What about the future borders of this country? So the military censorship was active. And by the way, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Empire, there were three stages to the censorship. The official military messages are basically misleading, false in the nature. I even quote comments from Poles and Jews about that. So these people were reading the messages from the Austrian army and the message suggested that the Austrian army was hugely successful and the Poles and Jews asked, okay, but why are they located uh, near Krakow and not at Lwów if they keep on scoring victory af uh, after victory on the front line? So there is no access to actual true and accurate information. And that leads to con conspiracy theories, just like it happens today with the pandemic, for example, COVID-19. So it's just like war. The war against COVID is a war as well. So the mechanisms are quite similar. And Professor, you highlight the fact that these are similar reactions from people. So we tend to imagine things. We see enemies and spies all around us in everyone, we find everybody suspicious. We report our neighbors to the authorities. People quarrels, quarrel, all families are divided and, and all that leads to internal rifts. People do not trust one another. Husbands and wives do not trust each other. People do not, ask the, uh, uh, do not trust the priests. And so that's a problem. And so different histories and stories are created, which are unfounded. For example, that cars carrying gold uh, would be driven by nuns across Poland. Others would uh, others said that these cars with gold would be driven to Russia because Russia needed money and people basically hunted the cars crossing Poland, causing accidents. And so these were regular people driving their cars. And of course, there were a few cars back then. So imagine how would it be, would it be, what would it be like today? But again, it's like a, a state of mass hysteria. So that's something that we, we had. And right now, we know that there was a lot of gossip 
and even today people tend to pass on gossip to one another and they talk about the rumors of course later on people tend not to believe any every story they hear they start analyzing and they learn that rumors do not have to reflect actual facts that you have to adopt a different approach to gossip but of course there was there was gossip that was sponsored as well for example by the military so basically the military would start gossip and the same happens right now at the border with belarus we know that there are hackers sponsored by the president of russia that start gossip and that gossip circulates and then leads to inaccurate stories being told so the rumor the gossip is just like the fake news we know today that circulates in the media so gossip is just the gist and the essence of fake news that's it thank you uh, thank you professor I, i'd like to hand it over now to dan pogorzelski he'll uh read some questions that appeared in the chat and in the Q&A section uh, below, and, uh, and we'll continue the discussion from there. Excellent. Thank you so much, Professor. Always a pleasure to listen to you uh, gab away, as uh, you are um, so excellent at, and uh, listening to your wonderful, um, insightful uh, questions as well as answers. So thank you very much. Someone that here in Chicago is a, is a living legend, I would say. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone, for being with us today. Professor Falba, I would like to commend you on this really insightful um, lecture and uh, excellent answers that we've just heard. And now we will read out the questions that we have in our chat window. The first question comes from Jean Sokolovsky, who is a very interesting person. He is a PhD and he used to work at the um, US Aviation and the US Administration of Government. So the question is as follows. Professor, you wrote that during the First World War, there were casualties that were estimated at 2 million to 2.2 million with 400 to 500,000 killed. However, the gentleman is interested to know how many civilian casualties there were. So the professor mentioned the huge losses sustained by Poland and the tragic story of the Polish territory and the Polish people during the First World War. So, Professor, can you please answer that question? I will not be able to answer that question because I just don't know. What I can tell you is that nobody knows that and nobody will ever know that. And why is that? Because we cannot be sure how many Polish soldiers died. So what does it mean to be Pole? There were many Polish speaking people who were conscripted and many of them did not identify with Poland. They did not feel Polish because for many peasants, for example, Poles were noblemen gentry so they were not part of the gentry that meant that they were not polish and so the poles polish peasants who fought in the austrian army when they referred to poles uh, living on the other side of the river they called them russians because and then when they crossed into these lands, they were surprised to be able to communicate with those so-called Russians in the same language. And it turned out they even had the same religion and they were very surprised. And this proves that this question of national identity was different 
it will change later on in the 1920s and 1930s, but we cannot safely say how many Poles actually died in the war. What's more, there were thousands of people who went missing. Probably they died, but we cannot be certain. Some people died right away and others were wounded and died much later. Some of them died in 1980, 1990, 1920 due to certain medical complications of their wounds. Many suffered from mental illnesses and conditions related to their experience during the war and people died in 1925, in 1930 and they are not considered victims of the war because they did not die before 1980. So we don't really know, we cannot be sure of the number of Poles who actually died. And so, of course, thousands of historians across the world are trying to pinpoint how many soldiers died in the Great War. However, despite those efforts, we cannot be certain, even today, of the actual number. There are different numbers, different estimates being considered, but they will never be verified because there is no evidence, there is no hard proof and no, no reliable sources. And it's even more difficult in the case of civilians because we cannot really be sure if a particular person died because their households were bombed or um, because they were attacked or because they starved to death. We cannot be sure if that particular person died because of an outbreak of, uh, of a disease like the cholera. There were local outbreaks across Poland, typhoid fever and others. And then later on, of course, there was the Spanish flu pandemic that struck as well, that took its toll amongst both soldiers and civilians. The sanitary conditions deteriorated during the war. The living conditions deteriorated and the health of the population deteriorated as well. Poverty was widespread. Tuberculosis was widespread and becomes one of the leading killers. Of course, people died of TB before the war, but the rate, uh, the mortality rate, rate soared during the war. And that we can say, we can estimate how many people died of TB in 1914 and then in 1912 and 1918 or 19, the increase was fourfold. So these were the results of the war. However, we cannot be certain of the exact number of civilian deaths and nobody has ever attempted to actually pinpoint the number of Polish civilians who died during the war due to military action, due to warfare simply. So I'm sorry, but I cannot give you an answer. So yes, we have some white spots still, certain things that we will never know about the history of Europe, to jest tam, to jest ta niemoc, historyka, about który, no... the history of the world. There are blank spots, there are gaps in our knowledge. And sometimes we just don't have the sources that we can use. And we must always rely on, on sources if we want to be reliable historians. Thank you very much for your answer, Professor. And then we have the next question. It, this question comes from Joanna Fabisiak, who is the founder of the Be a Pole competition. And she also attended our parade in Chicago on the 3rd of May. That was the Constitution of the 3rd of May parade. If you're in Poland and you're not aware of that, um, that was the parade uh, that has the longest history amongst the Polish community in the US. And so the question is as follows. After 120 years of Poland being partitioned 
five different generations lived under different cultural conditions. They lived under different governance systems. The technical infrastructure differed as well. And so there were three different systems that had to be unified later on as Poland regained independence. So what um, traits of the Poles you would mention as those that would allow Poles to create a single coherent state? Can you rephrase the question, please? So I'd like to refer to what you said before. So as we said, we, you had a country that consisted of territories in which, for example, infrastructure uh, differed a lot. The track gauge, for example, differed. In the Russian part, the track gauge was just like in the rest of Russia. And then in Galicia and in the Pomerania region, the track gauge was, according, was made according to the European standards. So it was extreme, extremely important to unify those three different parts. So can you elaborate on that? Ja dziękuję bardzo pani poseł za zapytanie, bo ona dotyczy dotyczy możliwości mobilizacyjnych. It's concerned with what the Polish elites could do to bring the country together and to modernize it and to reconstruct it after the war, which ravaged the Polish lands. So rail tracks, its width. It was not so much a challenge because, so track gauge, it was somewhat irrelevant at the time because at a certain point, the Russians and Prussians take over the lands and they change the gauge in the, old, in the previously Russian lands. So it is, was something that was accomplished by the Prussians and by the Austrians. So Poland as a country didn't have to do much about that. But yes, Poland was divided into three partitions. So the partition powers did build different infrastructure. And basically those lands were oriented towards different capitals, right? So there was no direct connection between Krakow and Warsaw, right? Or between Poznań and Warsaw. You couldn't travel directly. These connections had to be built after World War I. Why? Because the powers, the partition powers were not really willing to build tracks that would lead to the borders because of military reasons. Uh, reasons. So, Poland passed this test over 1500 kilometers worth of um, tracks were built and the Polish authorities simply assumed that there would be a war against Russia and, uh, and, and Germany. So basically assumed that rail would be the main means of transportation. To build tracks, you need industry. And rolling stock that Poland came up with in those 20 years was excellent. The engines were produced in a number of different countries, in Krakow and Lwów and other towns and countries. Poznań, naturally, Cegielski, Cegielski's factory there. And there was this New York, New York exhibition, one of the Polish engines won gold as the best steam engine presented there. So the Polish rail arrived, would always arrived on time. You didn't need watches because, you know, the train would arrive always on time to the minute. In the early 30s, well, Mussolini, he built a totalitarian state. However, the Italians laughed 
Polish rail. And it was the Poles who taught certain things to Italians, namely how to create a reliable rail system. And till this day, in the south of Italy, you, you, they use this idiom, the Polish punctuality, that is, that trains arrive always on time. It was synonymous. Polish was synonymous with something that is on time. And coin, civil law, criminal law, currency, the currency system was disorganized. So Zloty, a new currency, had to be created. Grabski actually did that. It was a huge success, a common currency. So these efforts to bring people together, Poland together, was all that was successful. The mental divisions, though, they stayed. Those mental differences stayed. What I mean by mental differences? Basically, the life in various petitions had been different. It was especially true in Pomerania, in, Western, in the west of Poland. Those differences were there. And people didn't like it when people arrived in the West to work, arrived from poorer South and East. And even today, those differences show when you see the electoral map of Poland. People vote differently depending on which old partition they live in. I'm not sure if this answers um, Madam's question, but I hope I did. Dziękuję bardzo za odpowiedź. Tutaj widzę, że właśnie z naszej polonijnej szkoły świętego Błażeja mamy dwie pytania. So we have two schools from one of the Polish schools. So, basically, students are really involved. Let us put those questions to the professor. Konrad Pawełek, the first question. The war and this willingness to regain independence, was it supported equally by people in the cities and in the countryside, in the Austrian partition? Or maybe was there a division there? You mean the Austrian partition, the Austrian partition. Apart, uh, apparently, it, it is somebody from, from the Polish Galicia who is asking the question. So, somebody from Galicia, or as some people jokingly say, a Galilean. So, to give you an answer, it changed with time. At first, the people in the countryside, mind you, it was the majority. 80% of the residents of Galicia are the people who live in the countryside, peasants for the most part. Austro-Hungarian soldiers are, for the most part, par farmers. Now, moving on to Piłsudski's legions, the 1st Brigade and other troops, you have many young men from the countryside. You have Sokol's club, just like in the US, and they associate people, bring together people from the countryside. And these people volunteer to the army. They want to fight for Poland. In the second half of the war, there are six brigades of the Polish legions. And those peasant son form a majority over those that are that come from intelligentsia in close to the end of the war the the alliance has changed somewhat now the brest treaty the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. So what happened in spring 1918? The Germans made an agreement. I mean the Germans and the Austrians with the Ukrainian uh, People's Republic. It was a secret treaty. 
the provision stipulated that after the war, the Western part of the kingdom would make part of a Ukrainian country. Galicia would be divided into two countries, the Polish part, the Western Galicia with Kraków, and the Eastern part. It would be a separate country that belongs to Austria. However, it would be governed by Ukrainians from Lviv. And that made people furious, this treaty. It was meant to be a secret treaty, but people learned about that. The legions rebelled. General Haller is a legionnaire. He breaks through the front, goes to the other side of the front. And Polish peasants attack Austrian military and gendarmerie. Poles demolished a German consulate in Kraków. In Kraków and in Lviv, Lvov, you could see pigs to their tails were attached Austrian orders, medals that they had received from the Austrian emperor. Those pigs would run about in Kraków, in the city. Basically the same was happening in a number of other towns. It was meant to show that we have, that we want to have nothing to do with the Austrians. So the brest Treaty was really helpful in improving the national awareness of the Polish peasants. And that was the breakthrough. We don't want Austrians to govern, to rule. We want Poland. Thank you very much. It's very interesting that in some countries the Polish lands were brought together, the lands that had been petitioned for such a long time. There is another question from Professor Praszałowicz. She's a habilitated doctor, she teaches at the Egan University. I feel honored to see her here and the question. There are many religions here in Poland. You have Roman Catholics, Greek Catholics, you have Jews. So a question about the Jews. Some Jews were drafted into the Austrian army to the Russian army, did they experience this military drama to the same extent as ethnic Poles, Roman Catholic Poles? I mean, how many of them died, how many of them lost their households, and so on and so forth. This is a difficult problem, one of the mo more difficult ones, because now we're approaching this place where we start discussing really complex issues. So this tradition of knighthood was not inherited by Jews due to their professions, trades, their culture, their cultural culture was that of merchants rather than the culture of warriors. So Jews did not long for the war. And there is this Balkan crisis that breaks out. There are all these wars fought by little nations in the Balkan Peninsula. And this is when Jews realize that a bigger war can break out. Polish peasants and Jews that were drafted to the Austrian army, they resigned 
how do they do that? They use bribes. They bribe officials. I'll give you an example. Let me give you an example of Krakow. There were a number of bribe companies, doctors and veterinarians were actually employed. They would pocket the money to release people from the military service. Different excuses were used. I don't want to cover them here in detail. The thing is, people didn't want to die for the emperor. It was true not only about the Jews, but, you know, it was largely the Jews. So let's talk about recruits from Galicia. Roman Catholics. In 1913, there were around 9%, constitute around 9% of the Austrian army in this territory. The Jews constituted 3%. So many Jews simply uh, decided to not join the army. They get away from that. They would use various means. They would go abroad, they falsify data. And even that tells you that Jews were not terribly keen to join the army. The peasants from Galicia were willing to join the army. Well, there were some exceptions because some people could sense that an army would break out, so they didn't want that. But it was a minority. So then the war breaks out. What happens then? The Jewish shops are destroyed by the same artillery shells, by the same bombs. Everybody is dying indiscriminately. So the people die no matter what your religion is. So the Jewish shtetls, those Jewish towns, suffer too. In some of these, Jews made up 70% of the residents. The further you went to the east, the more numerous those towns were. So towns, cities were burning. And the Jewish property would burn too. So they did pay a very high price. They suffered too. But they continued whatever they could not to be drafted into the army. When they did get drafted, quite often these were educated people, some of them were doctors. And another thing, Yiddish is close to German. So Yiddish was more useful to the German and Austro Hungarian commanders. And many Jews would be employed as clerks. They would distribute food. So Jews had a better access to financial resources and to food. For that reason, as the end of the end appro is approaching, there is a growing tension between Jews and the Polish peasants and farmers. Jews are being a accused of speculation, of being involved in black market activities. So this relationship is really suffering. The relationship is much worse than it was in 1913 as a result of the war. I can see we have a question from Mietrzysław Herba. Who mentions the press and the role of the press? Stare porzekadło jest, czy to w języku polskim, czy amerykańskim, czy angielskim w Stanach, czy w Anglii, jest, że obraz wart jest tysiąc. And there is this old saying that says that one image is worth a thousand words. 
So there's a question about political caricature. Um, what was the role of that during the First World War? I understand that you're referring to the Polish lands because political caricature has an important role to play in the war, obviously. So basically, the war marked the beginnings of political caricature. It all, st it all started with the Brits and the Germans were the weakest players in terms of political caricature. So, British caricature was just like British wit. And German jokes and German humor is sometimes very obscure and not very easy to understand. So that was also reflect, reflected in caricature. But it, it, also, it, it, it has an important role to play in psychological war. It can also be seen in the Polish-Bolshevik war, where both Poles and Bolsheviks would use caricature that would be distributed in the form of leaflets and posters that would be, for example, displayed on fences and walls across cities, horse-drawn horse carriages were also um, full sometimes of, of, of posters with caricatures, so it was about mocking the enemy and that was a very effective weapon. And the best specialists were employed to do that. Even writers were employed, their help was enlisted, and they had a lot of experience to draw on in creating caricature. And there are also examples of Polish caricature uh, produced by the National Committee, the head National Committee that supported the legions. The legion, legions operated officially and the caricature was clandestine. So um, it was used to mock Austrian soldiers the organization established by Piłsudski in Warsaw, the Polish military organization, it was a very important um, institution that marked the beginning of the Polish underground state, and it also used caricature to mock the occupier, the Germans, the Austrians. Um, so the idea was to wage a psychological war and create the right conditions to tarnish the image of uh, the Germans and the Austrians. So in this sense, caricature was quite effective and a lot of books have been written about it. And um, a lot of uh, propaganda experts have written about that as well. So you're welcome to to try to find books about that particular topic as well. Thank you very much. Mieczysław Herba is a living journalistic bridge between Poland and the US. Uh, he worked for the Polish TV for a long time and now he works in Chicago in the local Polish TV station and he's a very hard worker and I think we should appreciate our journalists, both those in Poland and those here based in the US, who work as hard as Mieczysław. I think it's time for us to um, say farewell to Professor Patsyga. I think he has another Zoom meeting coming up and he is a distinguished speaker and that's why many people want to talk to him, so he uh, um, is about to leave us. We don't have much time, I am aware. 
But it's beautiful because we have a lot of students representing Polish schools in the US and they want to ask questions to Professor Chwalba from Krakow. And this question is a question about Paderewski, whom you have already mentioned, Professor. What was the impact of Paderewski in terms of the mobilization of the youth in the US? How did Paderewski manage to mobilize Polish youth in the US so that they got involved in the Great War across the pond? Paderewski obviously is not the only important figure of the time, but of course he had a very important role to play. He believed in Poland. He believed in the Polish cause. And that belief brought very good results. But it was only thanks to those associations of young Polish people. So the Polonia in America were people representing the second or the first generation of Poles living abroad. So they had very close relations with their country of origin. Many of them had been traveling between Galicia and the US for years before the war broke out. Many of them went across the pond, they made money there, and then they went back to Poland. It is estimated that by 1914, around 40% of emigrants returned to Galicia. So that goes to show that there was this very strong relationship between the Polonia and their small homelands on the other side of the Atlantic, with the small parishes, the small villages they came from originally. So these people felt close to their original homeland. And so there were Polish organizations that were established and that really upheld the Polish values and cherished that feeling of belonging to Poland. There was also, uh, it was, it was not, not only about the Poles, for example, the Czechs and the Slovaks living in the US, actually they had the idea to create Czechoslovakia. It all started in Philadelphia. So the US was a country that was a democratic one, maybe the demo democracy was not quite mature, but it was a country that offered liberties to its citizens. And in this way, in this sense, the education process in the US unfolded more quickly. And so very often those young Polish people were the first Gener was the first generation. These were the boys who were born in the US. They were 16 or 14 years old. They belonged to Polish associations or sports clubs. They, they belonged to Polish scouting organizations and the so-called hawks nests, which was an, a very important organization. The Polish Falcons Alliance, for example. So four fifths of the members were US born Poles. Many of them later went and um, joined the Heller's army. So people joined the army 
hoping to advance the Polish cause, hoping to help Poland regain independence. For example, there was a saber that was donated to Piłsudski by one of the Rifles Associations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very interesting answer. You have vast knowledge about this topic. You are a real authority in this respect. So thank you very much for your contribution. But we do have one single last question. Professor Falba knows what it means to be the president of the Congress of uh, American Polonia. And uh, we, the president works at NASA. I don't know if he is there with, up there with Jeff Bezos or with Mr. Branson, but we are very happy that he actually participates, that our representatives of the Polish Polonia uh, from the state of Illinois participates in the work of NASA. In Illinois, we have towns called Poznań or Radom. So, there's this question from President Nijinsky. Is it possible to buy your book here in the US? And if so, how can you buy it? I believe so. I believe it is doable. Paweł Kurtyka, the head of the Janusz Kurtyka Foundation, said that the book has been published by a global publishing house. So it was not published by a Polish publisher. It's a, it's been published by somebody, by a company that wants to actually sell it, to make money selling it. I've actually looked it up, basis has been mentioned, so I have looked it up on Amazon, because Amazon basically gives you easy and quick access to any title. This is a global network, so I believe the book can be purchased, because we are talking a publishing house that has a glo more global reach. It's not a small player. Thank you. Paweł Kurtyka has sent a link to uh, an Amazon website. Soon I'll be wrapping up, but before I do that, let me thank all the panelists, you, professors, and all those that have been asking questions, be it in the Polish Polonia schools and by others. Please remember that the American Polonia is thirsty for information, for contact. The foundation is quite active. The foundation is reaching out to those they do not speak Polish, so that we can share our culture and our history here in Poland. Here we can find people who have roots all over the place and we would like to share with them this treasure trove of the Polish history and of the Polish culture. Thank you for this great work that you did. And let me tell you that there are a number of interesting sources in English about the history of Polonia, of the Polish diaspora. They have not been translated to Polish yet. Hopefully, you'll find a translator, because there's a lot of information that can be found only in English, and we would like this information to be available also for Poles, for Poles in Poland. Let me also say thank you. Thank you, Professor Chwalba, for your time. Thanks to you, many students could listen to this talk. A number of 
different students from a number of schools who have been listening to this talk. Thank you, Professor. Thanks to you, we could touch history, if you will. You really brought it, brought this history to life. And you helped us to see how Poland regained independence. It was no easy task. Thank you, Mr. Gorzelski. Thank you, Professor Patsyga. And Natch, last but not least, thank you to the Foundation. Thank you, Veronika. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to start this cooperation. Thank you for this idea, for this concept and going through with it. We're looking forward to more such meetings. They're really great. Personal touch, personal um, contexts are really very important. And such conversations are the best history lesson you can think of, at least for me. I found it really interesting. Thank you on behalf of the Alliance of the Polish Clubs in USA. Thank you to all the participants. I hope to see you soon. Ja również na koniec chciałbym bardzo serdecznie podziękować za, zarówno dyskutantom, moderatorowi, moderatorom i the participants to the moderators. Falbie, thank you to Professor Falba and naturally thank you to prezes Związka Mirowska, the president of the Alliance of the Polish Clubs. Bardzo podobało wyjątkowo ciekawe. Bardzo cieszę się za z tej aktywności. Również państwa na czacie. Also, I'm really happy pytań, that you, ladies and gentlemen, have been following this meeting, you've been asking questions, jakby wzbudza zaangażowanie. To mnie bardzo cieszy. Chciałbym na koniec tutaj podpowiedzieć państwu, że wrzuciłem na czat link do I posted a link na, na serwisie Amazon it'll take bo tutaj you to padło pytanie o możliwości zakupu Amazon website because somebody has been asking about whether you can buy drogą, this book if you want to do that commercially you książkę. can follow the link a żeby buy it online. Też zachęcić do przeczytania tej pozycji Tutaj also, I would like to encourage you to read this book. Veroniką przy, i w ramach zespołu fundacji przygotowaliśmy taki spot próbujący tą książkę i myślę, że to będzie bardzo dobry akcent na koniec. Także bardzo proszę Weroniko o odtworzenie tej filmowej Veronica, zapowiedzi książki. In 1914, the great powers clashed and waged a war that shaped lives of generations. In the wake of the great conflict, some new nations emerged. Others recovered their long lost independence. This book tells the story of a nation divided for over a century between three empires. A tale of heroism and defiance, of patriots who wanted to fly their own colors. Far from the trenches of Verdun, and the rocky shores of Gallipoli, a different war was being waged, a war for independence and freedom. After over a century of oppression, Poland was to be free again. The People of Poland at War, 1914 to 1918, by Professor Andrzej Falbaugh, available on Amazon. Chciałabym bardzo podziękować za udział w dzisiejszym spotkaniu. Let me thank you for having participated in this event. There will be another event under our The Seeds of History project, the 4th of December 2021 on Saturday. It will take place at 5. It's introduced in time. The Polish witnesses to cutting. Encounter with Cutting is a book that touches upon this very subject. Please follow our social media, YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Thank you very much. See you then.